All right, so we got a very famous passage of Scripture here in Ecclesiastes chapter number 3. And um, we'll be focusing on that first part, of course, the, the very famous part where, where it says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And then it goes on and lists, you know, there's a time to be born, a time to die. There's a time, there's a time for everything, right? And, and it lists off many different things here. And what we preach out this morning, of course, the, the title of my sermon is A Time to Every Purpose. And I know a lot of people here weren't necessarily at the camping trip. They didn't get to hear uh, Brother Robert preach a great sermon for us on um, Thursday evening. And this also, the sermon I'm preaching this morning ties in with what I preached last week about being a good soldier for Jesus Christ. And just to give you the overall theme of what I'm going to be talking about, there's a, there's a time and a place for everything. Right? And in our movement, we hear a lot, of, a lot of hard preaching, a lot of strong preaching. And one of the things I want to teach on this morning is I think that people have a tendency to kind of take that in areas and apply the, the hardness and the hard preaching in other areas that are kind of out of the bounds or scope of, of, of when it's appropriate to be having either that type of a spirit or, or um, you know, making... It's making certain judgments, and, 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 and believe me, we're going to get into judging. It's not, I don't believe in this judge not ever mentality, okay? But there is a way that we are to behave ourselves in church. There's a way that we behave ourselves at home. There's a way that we behave ourselves and communicate with one another out in the world, you know, among brethren. Just, there's, there's so many different ways that we are to be um, handling ourselves. Now, there are many things that are all-encompassing, that it pretty much doesn't matter. I mean, we should be humble all the time. I mean, no matter what. There's, there's really no reason not to be humble. There's, there's many aspects that are, that are all-encompassing. But I'm going to be focusing a little bit more on some of the things where the Bible tells us sometimes to do more than one thing, two things that could even seem like they're op or they are opposites. So, for example, the first place I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up on here. Like here, I mean, this, and this is what we see here in Ecclesiastes 3 is a lot of opposites. There's a time to be born and there's a time to die. Life, death, you know, your birth, your death are two opposite things. There's a time to plant, you know, and, and, you're, and you're starting to grow things. But then there's a time to pluck up that which is planted. There's time to reap. There's a time to go out and take it. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. And see, I think today sometimes people get too focused on one side or the other and not have a proper balance in remembering, you know what, sometimes there is a time to kill. You think, well, how could there ever be a time to kill? Well, when we're, we're executing judgment on evildoers, and when I say we, I don't mean like we as a church, but just in general, the, you know, the, the, the nation, the human government that exists to execute the punishments upon evildoers, there is a time to kill sometimes, to take away somebody's life when they've committed a crime that's worthy of death. There is a time for that. And there's a time to heal. Amen. There's a time to break down. There's a time to build up. These things are opposite, but they all have their time and their place. And we need to recognize when is the right time and the right place to do these various things that the Bible is talking about here. Um, one of the things that people would say today, I'm in that verse number eight here, it says there's a time to love and a time to hate. And this is, this is one of the things that's popular in the culture today of just say, oh, don't hate, don't hate, yo, no haters, you can't hate anything, yo, you, you, this is hate speech, right? And, and hate is just demonized to a point of just, wow, I couldn't ever, ever imagine that anyone would hate anything ever. Just love, 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 right? I mean, love and hate are opposites. Now, does the Bible tell us we're supposed to love? Brother Matthew preached a great sermon just yesterday at the, at the um, camping trip. About loving one another, loving our brethren. It's a good sermon, and it's, and it's absolutely true, and it's correct, and that's what we should be doing. But there's also a time to hate. And we can't forget, we need, we need to have a balance and know that, yes, it is okay to hate sometimes, but right circumstances, the right place, it's not just this broad brush of just, well, it's okay to hate, so just hate everything. No, there's a time to do it. There's a place for it. It's not just all-encompassing. The same thing with love. There's a time when it's inappropriate to love somebody, but then there's many times where it's very appropriate to love somebody. So we need to get the right balance. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 97. We're going to go through a few of the Psalms. I preach an entire sermon called Hate Speech. So 
This is only going to be one small point of my sermon this morning. If you, if you aren't convinced with just the, with the little bit of detail I'll give you this morning, I recommend you go back and listen to that. It's posted up online, and you could hear the full-length sermon where I go into a lot more detail than what I'm going to cover this morning about this sub, just one subject of, of hating and loving. So in the book of Psalms, there's many references to, to hating. And we're going to see here in, in Psalm 9. Now, people say, oh, that's the Old Testament. Because right? I already know, they argue, oh, that's the Old Testament. What do you, you know, it's completely different in the New Testament. Well, look, God doesn't change, first of all. The changes that, are, that were made between the Old Testament and New Testament are, are, are covered very clearly, especially in the book of Hebrews, talking about the, the Old Testament sacrifices that have changed because they've been fulfilled. But all of the moral principles and, and, and teachings of the Old Testament, we don't just throw that stuff away. And besides, the Bible says that we're supposed to speak to, speaking to each other in songs, in hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms. That's why we have the book of Psalms. They're not just, I mean, they are songs to sing, but there's also a lot of doctrine and teaching and learning from them. And they're put to music, they're put to singing so that we could remember them. These are truths that are, that are supposed to stay with us. This is very, you know, the word of God, you know, all of God's word is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. There's, there's everything, every word of God is pure. So we're going to look at the whole Bible. And, you know, I don't have to prove that to you this morning. But um, Psalm 97, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. So he's saying, look, if you love God, you need to be hating evil. Pretty simple, right? We, need to, we have a hatred for it, not, not a tolerance for it, an acceptance of it, but a hatred for it. We need to hate evil. Psalm 101, if you want to just flip forward a little bit, Psalm 101, verse number three, says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. I hate it. I want to have nothing to do with those that turn aside. Those that don't want to follow the Lord, I want to have nothing to do with what they do because I hate the work that they're doing. I'm just going to love the Lord and serve him and, and do that type of work and have nothing to do with you that, that hate God or that are just working iniquity or whatever. I'm going to hate what you're doing. hate that work. If you want to flip back to, uh, to Psalm 26, we'll see it's not just the actions. Those two verses reference actions, right? You have this common phrase today, well, hate the sin and love the sinner. Right? And it's, and, that, and it's very common, and, and it sounds good. If you were just to, to be sitting in church one day and you hear someone just say, hey, you know what, we ought to hate the sin and love the sinner, you can use these two verses that I just quoted and say, see, yeah, we're supposed to have a hatred, and we're supposed to just hate the sin, hate the evil, right? And love the people. Now, there are instances where that's true. Absolutely, there's a, there's a little bit of truth to that. But first of all, that's not scripture. That's not, that's not a verse in the Bible. Hate the sin and love the sinner. That's, that's, that's actually something that, to my knowledge, Mahatma Gandhi came up with. That was his, his phrase that was coined and used uh, you know, as Hindu. But second of all, it's not, it's not completely accurate because there are times where the hatred is mentioned in the Bible not just towards action but towards people. And if you don't believe me, we'll prove it to you. Look at Psalm 26, verse number 5. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. Now, does this say I've hated the evil that these people did? Or have I hated the congregation? What's a congregation? It's a group of people. It's people. The church is a congregation. Where people gather together. He says, I have hated the congregation of evildoers. And will not sit with the wicked. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 31. Verse number 6. Psalm 31, verse number 6. I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. I've hated them. Not their lying vanities. I've hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. Flip back to Psalm 15. Psalm 15. I'm going to get the actual, I'm going to read the actual context for you. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? It's all about, about abiding, living, staying in the house of God, in God's tabernacle. 
Today that we consider that church, how, how am I going to stay in church? Verse number two, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart, all good things. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Again, living uprightly, not doing, not committing, getting into sin, not doing things against your neighbor. Look at verse number four. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned. That word contemned means hated or despised. A vile person is contemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. So we see in multiple places, and then in Psalm 139, or you can turn there if you'd like to, Psalm 139. We'll see one more reference. And this will, this will tie up this point. But we've already seen now three different references that talk about not just the sin, not just the wickedness, but actual people, a person, that people that could be hate that are that are being written about here that are that are being hated. Verse uh, 21, Psalm 139, verse 21 says, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. So again, it's referring to people, but he's saying he's being a little bit more explicit. Just like in Psalm 15, it said, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. Vile means disgusting. It's, you know, it's revolting, vile, refuse, vile. And you could look up when vile is used in the Bible, how, how bad that really is. And what we see here in Psalm 139 is, is look, and this is, this is the psalmist saying to the Lord, saying, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. And then later on in the verse, I don't have this written here, but he's saying, he says that, uh, you know, try me, Lord, and know my, and know my heart. Let me see. I'm going to just read it because I don't have this printed on my page here. Verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. He's right after saying, don't I hate them? They hate you, O Lord. I hate them with a perfect hatred. And then he's saying, try me, God. Check out my heart. Search me. See if there's any wickedness in me. And it's in God's word. This, is, this isn't just, oh, those are just David's thoughts. And he just came up with that out of his own wicked heart. And... Oh, but they happen to be preserved for us in the Bible as, uh, in the book of Psalms. No, this is God's word. This was righteous. This was right by God that he's saying these things. Amen. Now, don't get me wrong because we're not supposed to be these hateful, angry, just hating everybody type of people. I'm not saying that. The whole point of the sermon is to say, look, there is a time to love, as Ecclesiastes says, and a time to hate. And we need to remember and get, get clear, when is it appropriate? Because the vast majority of time, we're not going to be just hating. We will spend more time and should spend more time loving. Amen. We should be surrounding ourselves with people, with the brethren, with church, with loving God, with loving the lost, with preaching the gospel to them and doing all these things. But you know what? There's still evil, wicked people out there that are sons of the devil that we ought to be hating. Amen. Hating what they do hating what they stand for, and hating who they are. These are the people who are reprobate. Because look, at the, and this is why it's so, under, it's so critical to understand these doctrines in the Bible. Because you need to be able to reconcile all of Scripture. You need to be able to, to see all these various verses and say, well, how does this fit? How does this even work? If I'm supposed to love the lost, then how can I be hating them and loving them at the same time. You can't. But when you realize what the scripture teaches about someone being beyond redemption, someone who, is, who has pushed things too far with God, they are a wicked person in their heart that God has given them over to a reprobate mind that now they're just whatever wicked desires and lusts and everything else comes to their heart, they just do it. They hate God. Romans 1 goes through the list of all these various things that, that, that they are. They're haters of God who have nothing to do with them. They've already rejected him. 
They've gone beyond the point of salvation. Why should we try to love someone that God already has given up on and, is, and, and, and hates? There's no purpose to it. And in fact, it's wrong for us to be helping the wicked. We just saw that with Jehoshaphat. Remember when, when he was rebuked and chastened and say, well, now you're going to be punished. What are you doing helping the ungodly? What are you doing yoking up and helping fight their cause when they're a wicked people? You should have nothing to do with them. Don't be blessing them. Don't be helping them. You should be hating what they're doing. That's when it's appropriate. When you've got people, look, when there's a gay pride parade, hopefully it'll never happen here, but when you got the people promoting the most vile, wicked filth in this world for you to go out there and tell them, oh, I love you. That's wrong. Wicked. That's wicked as hell. That is a good example of when it's appropriate to hate them and to hate what's going on and to hate, every, you know, hate everything about it. If you love God, you're going to hate that vile, contemn the, the vile person and hate that wickedness. Obviously, we don't need to be full of, you know, and this isn't something that, consu you know, this isn't something that consumes me, right? This is something that people will uh, take and spin. The, the media will do this. And the haters of, of righteousness and, and the Bible will take the short clips. Because, you know, we post everything up online. I got nothing to be afraid of or ashamed of. I'll, I preach God's word all day and night. It's fine. And you want to take a small clip. And, and this is what they want to characterize people as. And say, oh, see, look at all these hate people. You know, look, is it right to hate? Sometimes you better believe it. I can't believe a preacher would say that. Yeah, the same people that would say, oh, I can't believe a preacher would say it's right to hate sometimes. What would you do if your child was molested? Are you going to love that person? The perpetrator that defiles your child? Are you going to love, you going to tell me you love them? There's something sick and wrong with you then if you're going to love a person that could defile your child or murder them, slice them up in pieces or anything like that. Yeah, there is a time to hate sometimes. It's normal and it's right. But it's not all the time. There's many people, most people, majority of people we should be loving and, and trying to help and doing good. Amen. And let's not get that screwed up either. Right. Let's not forget that it is the majority of time and the majority of people that we are to be loving towards and helping and giving the gospel to and doing what we can for. That is right. But it doesn't, just because that's correct doesn't mean that, well, we never hate them. Wrong. There's a time to every purpose under heaven. Time to love and a time to hate. There's a time to be angry. Turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. And I don't have this in my notes, but I've, I've, I've gone over this multiple times. This is one of the reasons why we're King James only. The Bible says to, uh, not to be angry with your, with your brother with, without a cause. And the modern perversions change that to just be, be not angry with your brother. And they, they remove the phrase without a cause. By doing so, by doing that perversion of Scripture and removing of God's Word, do you know what that does? It turns Jesus Christ into a sinner. Because the meaning then, when you remove without of cause, which just says, be not angry with your brother. Well, what happens when Jesus Christ was angry? When he was angry with his brothers. We're going to get to that in just a second. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 26, the Bible says, be ye angry. That's like a command. Be ye angry and sin not. So is it possible to be angry and still not be sinning? Yep. Absolutely. Otherwise the Bible couldn't say this. Be angry and sin not. Then it says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. So what the Bible is saying is, look, you be angry, but don't sin. Be, have righteous anger, don't sin, and don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. 
See, this is how we keep ourselves from being a quote-unquote angry person. You don't want to retain this anger with you all of the time. It's going to make you bitter, and it's going to spoil your heart, and it's going to make you not you know, as loving as you ought to be in general. Right. So we need to, look, it's fine to get angry righteously. Get angry with the wicked. Get angry at the, the people who hate Jesus Christ and are fighting against God. That's fine to be angry, but don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. What that's saying is, you know what, when the day's over, you ought to be able to wake up the next day and not just retain all of that anger with you. Amen. Not just let that eat you up inside. Hey, man, let's, you know, move forward. Move on. You got angry. If it's righteous, righteous anger, it's fine. You're not sinning. But don't just dwell on that. Right. Keep going. Turn if you would to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. This is, this is one of the examples where we see Jesus getting angry. There's another one where he flips over the tables in the temple. A couple times he does. It's not just once. He walks in the temple and he sees them buying and selling. And he, you know, he flips over the tables and he makes a whip and he drives out the people who are buying and selling out of the temple. And he says, you know, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. And they're coming in and corrupting God's house. And he had this zeal. And, and he was angry. I mean, there's no way you could say he wasn't angry when he's flipping over tables and driving people out with a whip. Get out of here! That was Jesus Christ, our Savior, our example. He had a righteous anger. But did he just be bitter against the people then that were in the temple buying and selling after he drove them out and, and, and corrected the situation? Got angry about it, took action, corrected it, Moved on. Right. And that's, that is the righteous example. Mark chapter 3, look at verse number... Um, look at verse number... Let's look at verse number 1. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. Of course, they don't want to answer. They don't want to say what they believe. Jesus is preaching loudly what he believes. Look at verse number five. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. The Bible says that Jesus had anger when he looked around about on him. Did Jesus sin? Of course not. Because there's a time to be angry. There is a time when it's right to be angry with people. And it's fine in the appropriate time and place. But it doesn't, you know, but, I, but if you're an angry person, if, turn if you go to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. Right after the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22, verse number 24. The Bible says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. What people want to do is take things out of context. You know, like, like I was mentioning in this sermon, someone's going to post up and goes, Oh, yeah, see, he's real hateful. Oh, yeah, he's an angry man because he's, because he's yelling behind the pulpit. And to say, see, see, the Bible says, make no friends with an angry man. These are the same people that would take the snapshot of Jesus Christ looking around on them in anger or driving people out of the temple with a whip and saying, see, look, this is an angry man. And completely mischaracterizing who he is, what he stands for, and what he's doing. Watch out for that. Obviously, we shouldn't be friends with an angry man. But what does that mean? It's someone who's characterized by anger. I mean, if you're angry all the time, you're an angry man. 
If you're just always angry, if you're, if you're not letting the sun go down on your wrath, that's going to make you become an angry man. But just because someone has, especially when they see, and this, this just happened recently, I thought it was, a, it was, it's not surprising at all. But it's, it, it's so indicative of how the world works, of how Satan works, and how things have been throughout all of history. Recently, uh, Pastor Anderson made a video on, and put it up on YouTube because when he heard the name of Jesus basically being blasphemed with, with the Sam Gip thing and he was saying how it was a mistake and that Jesus' name really shouldn't be Jesus, it should be Emmanuel and all this other stuff, it's right to be angry when you hear somebody blaspheming the name of God. That's a righteous anger. And, and, to, and to give an angry rebuke over what was being said, you know what? That's appropriate. That's right. But you know what they do? They want to characterize as, oh yeah, see this angry man. Oh yeah, make no friends with an angry man. People who, who they see one clip, they don't know anything about the man. Anybody who knows Pastor Anderson personally, like I do, like I've known him for the past 10 years, knows that he's not an angry man. Does he get fired up and zealous and preach the word of God with power and, and sometimes he gets angry about sin and wickedness? Yeah, he does. But if you know him, would anyone characterize him as an angry man? Absolutely not. You spend any time around that man, you realize he's got a big heart. He loves people. He does things for people. He goes out, preaches the gospel. You know, he's done so many things for me personally that, you know, and, and not just me. I've seen him do so many things. There's so many other people that characterizes really who he is. So be careful not to take things out of context and see here's, but, and then this is part of the trap, especially with technology today, is that some people will see that one thing, even believers, I mean, saved people will see something like that and then just think, oh, that's how I should be reacting to everything and, ha and, and misapplying and misappropriating and having the wrong spirit about things that really don't warrant that type of a reaction over every little thing, Right? Every small detail, oh man, you don't believe this, I can't believe, you know, and you get all angry over something. It's like, you'll say, well, all of God's word is important. Yes, it is. But it's also a difference in the way that you deal with your brother in Christ than you do with some wicked Pharisee, false prophet. Like when Jesus was in this one example here in the book of Mark, when Jesus was looking around on them in anger, it was the Pharisees that were trying to catch him and say, oh, well, can you heal on the Sabbath day? That made him angry because they were hypocrites. And they had hard hearts. It grieved them, and it also made them angry. So we got to be careful to, to make sure that we're appropriate in our use, and, and you know, studying out the scripture and reading God's word is going to help you to realize when is it appropriate to be angry? Yeah. When is it appropriate not to? One way to, um, especially when we're talking about emotions or reactions, look at how many times the different reactions or emotions are brought up in the Bible. What are the context of it? Is it right or not? So, you know, Jesus is a perfect example. You look at all the stories, all the things that Jesus did. How many times do we see recorded where he was really angry? Not very many. Not very many. Where he's just, you know, driving people out of the temple. Did it happen? Absolutely. But what do we see the most of? Healing. Preaching the gospel. You know, doing, doing all the good works, preaching, just, I mean, everything. That, that's, what, that's what his life was summarized as. And, and you could, when you talk about Jesus Christ, that's what, I mean, that's what comes to my mind. Amen. When someone just talks about Jesus, the, the first thing that comes to mind isn't him being angry with people. Did he get angry? Absolutely. But does that characterize Jesus? No. No. And, and we could use the Bible for all kinds of different things. You want to know, when is it right? You know, we, like I said, I preached that, um, that sermon last Sunday about being a soldier. And I brought up many scriptural references to where Paul's saying, you know, we're fellow soldiers and we're a soldier for, you know, for, for Jesus. We're a soldier for the gospel. You know, we have a soldier in, in many aspects. But what does a soldier do? A soldier fights. That's the job of a soldier, right? And that's why one of the main things, one of the main points was we need to endure hardness. 
We need to be strong. We need to be able to stand. We need to have our armor on in order to be a soldier. But are we always acting as a soldier all at all points during our life? No. It's something that we, that we should be ready to fill that role at any time, to be that soldier, to, to fight that fight. But, for example, when you're among brethren, again, when you're among saved people, when you're among fellow soldiers, are you ready to fight each other? If you're, if you're, <laughs> if you're I mean, it's just real stupid simple, I get it. But if you're fighting a war, are you going to win that war if you turn and start fighting with your fellow soldiers next to you? Is that going to do any good at all? What's that going to accomplish? Oh, wait, that's going to let the enemy win. Remember that. There is a time and a place to be a soldier. Fight the good fight. Amen. But who are you fighting? Where is the battle? What are you fighting over? How are you fighting? Obviously, we're talking about a, a spiritual battle. We're not talking about anything physical. But turn, turn if you would to Galatians chapter 2. We don't have to go making everything a battle. And again, especially the, the most inappropriate time is when you're dealing with your brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, and, and I think that the the atmosphere, the place that harbors the most corrupt form of, of Christian behavior is on the internet. Yeah. Too many people say things that they would never say to someone face to face. And too many people get puffed up in their own pride they read things wrong or they read things right, but they just, they, they, they have this attitude and they get this keyboard warrior mentality of, I'm going to fight everybody all the time and I don't care if you're in a good soul winning church and you love God and you're doing what's right. You're wrong about this and I'm going to make sure everybody sees how wrong you are and I'm going to start calling you names and whatever. Tell you how stupid you are. And it's ridiculous. Amen. And I'm sick of seeing, you know, I, don't, I hardly ever get online anymore. Honestly, like I get on a little bit here and there, but, but it's, it's very seldomly, as anyone probably realizes. I mean, I don't even, I don't even really post on our, on our church page. I just do the, the live streaming and that's about it. There's so much, because you know why? Because I hate the environment. Right. It's gotten so toxic. And it's a shame because there's so much good that could be done there. And it has been used for so many good things. It's been used to mobilize people in different areas to go out soul winning and do good great work for Jesus and, and to learn good doctrine and, you know what, to share ideas. And there's nothing wrong with talking about doctrine and having disagreements with people that are believers, that are saved, that study their Bible and love God and go soul winning, but to disagree about a doctrine, you know what, that's fine. It doesn't have to be some fight and some battle where you're just, you have to show them wrong and you're right. There used to be a time, I believe, when people can have opposing views and actually have a civil discussion without resorting to name calling. Amen. That ought to be the way it is, especially among the brethren. Right. You're not exhibiting very much love when you start calling people a bunch of names that's your brother in Christ. What's the point of that? And look, you could stand firm on the Bible and what you believe. And you could try to persuade people as much as you want. Good. Good. Reason together. But don't let it get personal. Don't let it get into this, into this match of, of where you're fighting each other. You're supposed to be your fellow soldier and you're out there they're waging war against each other. In this, in this fantasy online world. Now, there are times when people need to be corrected that are good, godly, righteous people. It happens, but it needs to be done appropriately as well. Galatians 2 gives us a great example of this. The Apostle Peter was a great man of God. Did a lot of things for Jesus. Was a great soul winner. Was a pastor of a church. 
The Apostle Paul did a lot of great things for God, won a lot of souls to Christ. He was not a pastor. But he was living by example. He was exerting, he, had, he was an apostle. He had authority over churches. He had authority over a lot of things. Both great men of God. But you know what? We see an instance where Peter did something wrong. Peter was at fault. And it wasn't just some personal sin of Peter's, but it, 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 it impacted a lot of other people. It actually kind of started having a big effect. Where the Apostle Paul said, you know, he, he realized this is appropriate. I need to get involved here and do some correcting. But look at the way he corrected him. Did he call him a clown? Did he call him an idiot? Did he call him stupid or, or any of those things? Well, look at Galatians 2. We'll see. Verse number 11. The Bible reads, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't get it on his computer. I know they didn't have computers then. But he didn't, get his, he didn't, he didn't write a note to him and, and pass it to him, right? <laughs> Through someone else. He didn't send a message. Okay, give this to Peter. <laughs> Not what he did. He said, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. He was wrong. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. So before these people came in, Peter was doing everything right. He's eating with the Gentiles. Why? Because there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. It you know, doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. That is the good doctrine and the right doctrine. So knowing this, and having the vision himself, Peter did what was right. Okay, I'll eat. I'll eat with the Greeks. I'll eat with the Gentiles. No big deal. But then these other guys came from James. And James had a problem with this. And they were, you know, and again, this is something that was incorrect that they believed. They came from James. It says, but, what, but when they came, when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. He's fearing these Jews in what they believe instead of doing what's right. So now he separates himself from the Gentiles. Oh, no, I need to keep myself from them. Verse number 13, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So Peter was a leader. He was an elder. A lot of people looked up to Peter, and for good reason. He did a lot of great things. Again, I'm not just totally bagging on Peter, but when you do something wrong and need to be corrected, this is appropriate. So Paul withstands him in the face saying, look, like, you know, you're not eating with these people. All these other people are looking at you. Now they're not eating with the Gentiles. And now you're trying to bring back this nonsense that there's a difference between the Jew and the Greek. When you know that's not true. Because you're afraid to just stand up and do what's right. Verse 14, but when I saw that they walked not upright, uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew... And look, at, here's what he said. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Did he berate him? Did he call him a bunch of names? No. He made a point. He, made, he, he withstood him to the face. He said, hey, Peter. And walked up to him. And he said his peace unto him. And corrected him in a godly way, and I believe even in a humble way. I mean, he didn't just rip him a new face, but he, he, he very clearly articulated by making his point, hey, look, if you're a Jew, living after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why are you compelling the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Why are you trying to bring them under bondage? That was, that was his, his rebuke. And it was totally appropriate. The message got across. Peter received it. And they kept on going. And they're able to continue working together, serving the Lord. Right. That's appropriate. They're fellow soldiers fighting for the same cause. There was correction needed, and it was dealt with appropriately. We need more of that today. Turn, if you would, to, uh, you're in Galatians, right? Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. So remember from Ecclesiastes 3, it says there's a time to break down and a time to build up. It seems like too many Christians in our movement are not focused on the right things to be breaking down. Destroying, right? You're breaking stuff down. 
Elijah broke down the altars of Baal. Amen. Let's break down the wickedness and the, and, and the, the wicked false doctrines and the wicked false prophets. And, you know, let's break that stuff down and then build up the good stuff. Build up the right preaching. Build up the word of God. Build up Jesus Christ. Build up soul winning. But we're not supposed to be breaking down other believers. We're supposed to be building them up. What Paul, what, what Paul said to Peter was not breaking him down at all. He was making his point and ultimately going to build him up because he feared these people. He got the rebuke he needed. Okay, yeah, you're right. I should be doing this. Ephesians chapter 4. And again, keep in mind because we're the, uh, the verse that said to be angry and sin not. Right after that, in verse, verse 29, it says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Edifying is building up. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Many people are grieving the Holy Spirit because they don't have the right spirit. They're not acting right towards their fellow believers. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We ought to be kind one to another. Treat people with respect. Don't just go mouthing off every time someone believes something different than you or you think they're wrong about something. And again, these are things, you, the vast majority of the time, I don't think these people would, would ever say the things that they're saying online. Either because they're a coward or because they would realize it's not appropriate in person, but they don't realize that it's inappropriate online. And they get carried away. And I don't think, I honestly don't think it's mostly people just being cowards. I think they just get caught up in this, this bad spirit. And they have to sit, just prove everybody, you know, prove themselves right and prove everyone else wrong and, and show how, how spiritual they are. But they would never do that in person, face to face to somebody. It's bizarre. I don't know. I mean, look, it's bizarre. I know I've gotten caught up in that slightly myself. You start going on and on and, and it's like, it turns into this, I'm going to dig my heels in and they're going to dig their heels in. And what started off as this difference in belief, now all of a sudden is, you're a heretic, you're not even saved. You're, you know, it's like, how did you get to that? Right. I think you use the example of alcohol, right? In your sermon, on, 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 and that's a great example. Do I believe that, that Christians should be drinking alcohol? Absolutely not. I think, I think the scripture is extremely clear about this subject. But are there people that believe in Jesus Christ and are saved and they're born again and yea, even soul winners that will disagree with that and say, you know what? I don't think every sip of alcohol is a sin to take a drink. Are there people that believe that? Yes. Do I think they're wrong? Absolutely. But am I going to call that person a heretic? Because they don't believe the same way I do? No, of course not. Now, will I try to correct them and show them and prove and provide, you know, provide examples? Sure. Absolutely. <coughs> but is there any need for name-calling and calling people idiots and stupid and uneducated and you don't know any, you know, no, absolutely not. Amen. Absolutely not. And look, I'm firm on that doctrine, by the way. I'm not shaken. I'm not going to move on that. I'm not going to budge on that. I think, it's, I think it's clear, and I think people who don't believe that are lacking some wisdom or are lacking some knowledge about that. <coughs> but you don't approach them as the enemy. You say, yeah, but they could steer people wrong. Yes, and that's why they need to hear a rebuke similar to the way the Apostle Paul did it. But that's what's appropriate. And it's up to them to receive it. And if they don't, you don't start calling them a bunch of names. I mean, again, it's, 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 it's how do we deal with people? <clears throat> Turn if you go to 2 Corinthians 10, please. 2 Corinthians 10. It 
2 Corinthians 10 describes the tearing down that we, need, that we ought to be doing. Not tearing down each other. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 10, verse number 3, the Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Again, it's a spiritual warfare. It's not, it's not a flesh. It's not carnal. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. So even Apostle Paul saying, look, I have more authority. God's giving it to us for your edification, which means building you up and not for your destruction. We are to be casting down the imaginations and the wicked high places, the spiritual wickedness in high places, and in the evil doing, and tearing all that down. That's our spiritual battle. That's our spiritual warfare. That's what we're soldiers against. But we're building up our fellow soldiers, not tearing them down. Turn if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We're brethren. Every believer in Jesus Christ, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a family. We all love each other as a family and help each other out and edify one another. Encourage. Sometimes a rebuke. Right? I mean, you love your family, you love your brother, you love your sister. I mean, even physically, sometimes they need to be told they're wrong. Sometimes your brother or sister in Christ needs to be told they're wrong when it's appropriate because you love them. And again, you're not just going to try to tear them down and tell them they're wrong. You're, you're trying to tell them they're wrong so that they can correct their error and not make them feel like an idiot. When Jesus Christ said, you know, have you not read? He's talking to the Pharisees. He's saying, look, don't you know this? And, he, and he's calling them vipers and stuff. He's talking about false prophets. He's talking to pro false prophets. You don't need to be talking that way to someone who's a believer in Christ, especially, you know, maybe someone who spiritually isn't as grown as you are. The same way you ought not to be telling your children, what are you, an idiot? No, I'm five. Of course, the five-year-old's not going to say that. But you as an adult ought to know that. Now you want to teach them what's right, but you don't, you don't, you don't tear them down. You shouldn't do that spiritually either. First Corinthians chapter five. Because even though we are supposed to be helping each other, loving one another, in general. There's also exceptions to that where you're, there's going to be a time where it's inappropriate to be loving and helping someone even when they're a brother in Christ. Verse number 9 of 1 Corinthians 5 says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the, co with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must you need to go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. This is talking about a saved person. This is someone who calls themselves, they're called a brother. They've been in church. They know better. This isn't just some brand new believer. This is someone who knows better. This is a brother in Christ. Say, hey, brother. And they get caught up in any of this. You know what the Bible says? Don't go helping them out when they're covetous, when they're a drunkard, when they're a railer. So you know what? I'm not even going to eat with you. Shame on you. 
That's not how you're supposed to be behaving. You don't go and just, just, just support what they're doing. If you have someone that's called a brother in Christ and they're a drunkard, don't go giving them money. Oh, I'm poor. You know, I need help. Come on, brother, help me out. You're a drunkard. I'm not even going to go eat with you. That's where the Bible says we're supposed to deal with that. Now, you may say that's unloving. But that's what God said to do. So it doesn't matter what you think about it. And yes, there is a time to judge. So we're getting to, down to the last point, pretty much, my sermon here. Right where we just read there, verse number 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are without. He's saying, don't, aren't, you know, look, look, what do I have to do with to judge the world? He's saying, God's going to judge the world. Can't you judge within the church? I mean, don't you at least judge within your church to see like if there's people that are, that are this wrapped up in these serious, grievous sins to be able to deal with that appropriately and say, no, we're not, I'm not even going to have lunch with you. Judgment. He says, them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Turn if you would to Matthew chapter 7. Because there is a time to judge. Jesus Christ himself said in John 7, 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Everybody judges. How do you determine what's right or wrong unless you're judging? You judge right from wrong. You judge actions, whether they're right or wrong. You judge everything. So to say judge not ever, that's ridiculous because you have to judge. By someone telling me not to judge, you're judging me. Everybody judges. But we need to make sure we're judging righteously, the right way, not judging you know, inappropriately or, or judging just out of our own heart or just, well, my opinion is that, no, look, judge according to God's word. Judge righteously. Judge the way God told us. God tells us what's right and wrong. Amen. We don't come up with it on our own. How do we have any idea what's true and what's false? It's what the Bible says. Now, God's given you a conscience. He's given you some guidance. But at the end of the day, we're relying on his word, saying this is what's right. We need the right balance. Some people are always looking for what's wrong with everybody else. And see, that is an improper judgment. You're just, just constantly looking at what's wrong with everybody else. Those people need to look at themselves first. And this is what Matthew 7 is talking about. This is exactly what Matthew 7 is talking about. we got people judging everybody else, every little thing. And, you know, and among the believers also. These are the people that with every single church. Oh, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. I can't go to church anywhere. Because they're wrong. And all they're just judging everybody else on everything else. Why don't you turn it back on yourself? Oh, perfect one. Matthew 7, number, verse number 1, the Bible says, Judge not that you be not judged. You know, people want to judge everybody for every small thing. You know what? The judgment that you're judging on everyone else is going to come back to you. Verse number 2, For with what judgment ye judge, that's exactly what this verse is saying, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. Understanding Matthew 7, so many people just don't get, I don't even know how you cannot get this, what this is saying. I don't. I don't understand. Like, like, unless you just don't read the rest of the chapter other than verse 1. Because when you read it, it's clear. He's saying, look, however you're judging people, it's going to come back to you. That's Because you're setting the standard. Right. So if you're going to set the standard, you better be sure that when you're judging someone else, you're not guilty of the same things because then you're a hypocrite. If you're judging someone else, condemning someone else, and you're guilty of the same thing, well, guess what? That condemnation is coming right back on you. The Bible's saying, don't do that. And you say, oh, but I'm trying to help them out. And that's why it brings up this example of, of someone with a moat in their eye, which is just like a small, you know, you get, a, you get something caught in your eye, a little piece of dust, speck, whatever. That's really uncomfortable. That causes you problems. 
You want that removed. But the person that's going to help you is not going to be the person that's got a big tree branch sticking out of their eye. <laughs> right? Be like, I got this little piece of dust. Don't worry. Don't worry about this. Okay, look, I'll take care of this. Y you take care of that branch that's coming out of your face. Okay? Get rid of that first because I don't think you're going to see very clearly to help me get this little tiny thing out that you need a microscope for. That's what the Bible's saying. And, and like I said, you know, people apply this in so many areas. And, and what it boils down to, I think mostly, is a, is a sense of pride, where people think that they're right about everything. And they don't even realize, you know, just like the, the church of Laodicea, oh, we're rich and increased with goods and we're great and look how good we are and we got this awesome church and God loves us. And you don't realize that you're poor and wretched and miserable and wicked and, you know, like, you don't even realize it. You don't even see your own hypocrisy. But this, this describes to a T, and it, you know, this is something that bothers me quite a bit. I'll be honest with you, it bothers me. When people can't get in church and stay in church. Can't ever find the right one. No, no church is ever good enough. I run out to these people out soul winning from time to time. I ran into one guy. He literally just told me, he's like, yeah, all the pastors around here are idiots. I've tried all these churches. Like, of course, he never came to our church. So they don't know anything. They, they don't know anything. I sat down with them for a while. Because I was trying to give them the gospel. Because the guy's not saved. Yet he knows everything. And he wants to talk about all this stuff about the serpent seed and people being physical, child, children of the devil, like when, when Eve was deceived in the Garden of Eden that somehow the snake and Eve had some type of relationship together. And, and that's where Cain came from. You know, like, I mean, it's just bizarre. I mean, it's like, wh where do you come up with this stuff from? And yeah, all these other pastors are idiots. They're the stupid ones. And nobody's preaching the right thing. I wonder why. Maybe it's because you're wrong. Have you ever even considered that? That you got caught up into some bizarre fable, fairy tale of, of interpreting scripture? But this is where people get to, too. This is one of the dangers, as a side point, of getting involved in all of these various concordances and these Bible dictionaries and looking up the Greek and looking up the Hebrew and saying, oh, well, the Hebrew has 10 And this is what he did, too, because I was like, what are you even talking about? I want, I'm like, where are you even getting this from? Because you're not getting it from reading the Bible. And he says, well, look at this. The Hebrew word here for beguiled, because that was the word he was hung up, a beguiled. Because I say, he's like, well, what does that mean? So he asked me, she was deceived, she was tricked, because that's what the word means. And, like, the first two words were, like, deceived, tricked, you know, and then, and then, like, the fourth one was seduced. So, you know, the fourth definition, see, look, she really was seduced, but, you know, yeah, if you want to just start redefining words that can have different meanings based on context and then just throw out context and let's say, let's put, what was that, uh, the, uh, as I can't remember, like ad libs or mad libs, or mad libs was called, where you have like, like these stories and you just come up with random nouns and verbs and just whatever you, just, just pick a noun, pick a verb, pick the, you know, and then, and then you, you see how silly the story is because it's just doesn't make any sense in the context and it's real funny. That's like what this guy's doing. Right. He's just picking out, oh, oh seduce, yes, yeah, seduce, and just coming up with all kinds of bizarre doctrine and calling everyone else stupid. Like, yeah. nothing's ever good enough. Instead of saying, hey, what's important? Really, what's important? What's, what's, what is the main message and theme of the Bible? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And, you know, I mean, th these are the things that are important. You find someone who has the word of God. You find a church that's preaching off God's actual word. You find a church that's doing work for God, that's going out and winning souls. And you say, oh, but I don't like the way that you do the singing. I don't like that way you do the... Get in church! Stop nitpicking and judging over every little thing and get right with God and stop judging. You got a big beam sticking out of your eye. Get in church and do what's right. 
And we have people have come and gone through this church, and it's just, it, it boggles my mind. It, it really, it, <laughs> do you notice? It, it kind of irritates me a little bit. And you know why? Because the people, and look, save people, I'm not, I'm, you know, it's, it's not a, you know, I'm not even saying like heretics that come through. But it's like, we live in an area. Where else are you going to go? Who else is doing the, the basics and the minimum of preaching the word of God? Like, I mentioned this at the beginning. I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. And if you're trying to find the perfect church, you'll never find it. There's going to be something that you disagree with me about. And you know what? That's okay. As long as we believe the same gospel, as long as we believe that King James Bible is the word of God, you know, as long as we believe in real basic principles, we can all work together and do something good for Christ. Amen. But you know what happens when you're out of church? You're going to do nothing for Christ at all. Right. Turn forward to Hebrews chapter 10. Look, I've been to churches. I've been to churches that, that pledge allegiance every service to the American flag. Okay? I don't care where you stand about that. I think it's silly. I don't think it's appropriate to be doing that in church in God's house. But you know what? I went back to that church because we went soul winning. Because I still would hear the Bible being preached. And did I disagree with them about that? Yeah. Okay. So what? I'm not going to let the, you know, I'm going to let the sun go down on my wrath on that one issue and not, and not let it worry me and just get me out of church altogether. Well, there's no good churches around here because this one says the Pledge of Allegiance. Get over yourself. Seriously. There's a time to judge and a time to refrain from judging. When you've got a beam in your eye, it's not the time of judge. And if you're forsaking the assembly, then you've got a big beam in your eye. You are not, you should not be judging anybody on anything when you can't even get your butt in church when you live in a town that's got a great church. Hebrews 10 verse 24 says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. This is, this is what church is for. You're going to be edified and built up into doing good works and doing a good work for God. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The real problem in most cases has nothing to do with integrity to God's word. Because that's what people, you know, the, the guy that I referenced before, I believe in the serpent, you know, he's just thinking that like, well, this is God's word and, you know, he didn't have, it's not that he had some integrity to God's word. That's not why he's not in church. It's not the real reason. It has to do with laziness or pride or both. In his case, I think it was pride because no one could teach him anything. And when no one could teach you anything, you can't, you can't learn anything. You're never going to grow. Mr. Know-it-all. And you know what? You know what's funny? Okay. You know everything. You've got it right. Everyone else has got it wrong. What are you doing about it? If everyone else is wrong, hey, why don't you start a church? Why don't you tell everyone the way it is? Why don't you warn people? Why don't you tell everyone how important what you believe is? Instead of sitting at home and doing nothing. Don't talk to me if you're not going out and, and saying, well, everyone else is wrong, but I'm not going to do anything about it. You either move somewhere that's got it right, or you start doing something about it. Someone that doesn't want to do anything for God will probably not last long in this church, the lazy people, because you'll be hearing it preached over and over and over again. We're doing the challenges. We're doing everything else. And, you know, hopefully it's the whole point is to, to motivate you and to get you to do something. This life is short, and I don't want to waste it. And I don't want you to waste it either. I want you to do something. I want you to get over your pains and your problems and your, and your fears and everything else that might be holding you back from serving God and just push through that and let's serve Him. And someone that can't be taught anything is not going to last long in this church either. We teach a lot of doctrine here. 
And there may come something someday that people in this room you might, you might disagree with. And you know, I'll tell you right now, okay. You love God, you want to serve him, you want to preach the gospel, you believe the same gospel, let's work together. You're not, you're not preaching heresy and some false gospel. Let's serve God. And I would hope that you could reason together. And, it, and, and you know, the last point is why it's so frustrating when people leave and just don't, you know, it's like when there's a difference of opinion or a difference of doctrine, you know what? I still have yet for someone to come to me and approach me and talk about where they think I'm wrong. Because if I'm so wrong about stuff, why don't you actually come and tell me where I'm wrong and try to prove your point? Because I'm not above learning. But no one ever does that. They just get their feathers ruffled and leave. I'm here. I'm waiting. I'm open. I'm not going to start casting names out and belittling you. I'm willing to have a discussion with anybody. We had one person that came to this church that actually brought up some things to my attention. And I appreciated that because he didn't believe the same on a lot of different things. That person had integrity because they were bringing up points or different beliefs and we could talk about it. And if you still disagree, fine. But at what point are you going to say, well, this is just, this is, they are just not doing right by God. They are not a legitimate church in God's eyes. I'd be hard pressed by, even some of the people that have, that have come and gone through this church in a short time we've been here, I'd be hard pressed to, to, to find someone that would actually go as far as to say, yeah, they're not doing anything for God. This is not a legitimate church. If you think this isn't a legitimate church, then by all means, get out. You should not be here if you don't think this is, but if this is a legitimate church and we're serving God, and we've got the right gospel and we're doing something, some work for the Lord, then why would you not stick around? Where else are you going to go? That would be my question. Get over your pride. There's a time and a place for everything. There's a time to judge. There's a time to hate. There's a time to love. There's a time to do everything under the sun. Read Ecclesiastes chapter 3 again. Let's make sure we have the proper balance in our life. Don't be misapplying the, the, the anything one way or the other. The hating, the loving, the, you know, the rebuking, the, the judging, whatever. Whatever the case may be, let's do it appropriately. Let's have the right spirit. And at the end of the day, let's serve God. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for... Your words, we thank you for the instruction that we receive from the Bible, dear God. I pray that you would please continue to build this church, Lord. And, and any people in the past, God, that, that have left our church, I pray you'd bring them back. I pray that there would be, um, um, that, that you would work in, in their hearts and in our hearts, dear Lord, and that uh, in the future, if, if, if people have, do leave and come back, dear Lord, that we would have the proper spirit and attitude here at church and that we don't look down and start judging other people and, uh, and, and start asking them a bunch of questions, but Lord, that we would just receive them gladly back to church. Pray that you please help us to, to have the proper spirit, to know when it is appropriate to, to be loving people, to be hating people, dear Lord, and to, and to just do what's right in your eyes. Dear God. We want to act appropriately. We want to do the things that are pleasing in your sight as Jesus did, Lord. Help us to do those things. Help us to know those things and help us not to be afraid to act the, the way that is appropriate regardless of what our society or culture tells us to do, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.